Both archaeologists and historians have grappled for decades with understanding the transition from a medieval mode of production to the capitalist mode of modernity. The agency for this change has variously been ascribed to entrepreneurs, to political action, and rises in economic productivity. Traditionally, an evolutionary narrative has been adopted, characterised by methods such as long-term studies of economic growth and movement in price indices, which have an almost teleological element to them. As the historian Martha Howe tells us, the economic history of 14th, to, uh, 14th century commercial giants like Venice or Bruges easily becomes a story of capitalism's birth. Such a frame evokes something like a biological narrative, as though the market economy of modernity was the harvest of a seed that contained the DNA of the future. In thinking about the emergence of markets and patterns of consumption, Frank Trentman urges us to resist the temptation of claiming a revolution in a particular time or place. These two statements <coughs> cause us to pause and reflect on how we understand the commercial developments of the Middle Ages in Europe and how they relate to modern capitalist economies. Howell warns against teleological narratives in which modern capitalism is the inevitable end point. Of course, we don't know what comes next and Trentman against an academic preoccupation with staking a claim to being the period <coughs> and place which harvested the seeds of modernity. In addressing this problem, I found it productive to take an approach derived from the writing of Deleuze and Guattari. In Anti-Oedipus, they argue that social formations such as the state or feudalism exist as a means of coding desire, the driving force which pulls people and the material into promiscuous, unpredictable, and crucially productive relations. By territorialising or gathering and coding or ordering relations into social units, this productive potential is dampened. Capitalism, they suggest, is distinctive in that it's constructed on the basis of decoded flows. That is, value is not ascribed by socio-cultural -co code, but by the abstract mechanism of money. Capitalism did not emerge fully formed. Pre-capitalist modes of being were gradually broken down or overcoded, to use that term, by <coughs> flows of capital, goods, and ideas, which infiltrated the poorer society and broke it apart from the inside. Capitalism then can be understood not as an end of economic development, but as an emergent effect of productive relations, which in turn is generative of new relations, of releasing desire to allow new social formations to occur. This idea of capitalism as effect raises the question of how this can be studied archaeologically. I suggest it can be fruitfully achieved through the study of the micro-history of confrontation. In medieval England, the household was a key site of both production and consumption, and therefore this seemed like a logical place to begin. Over the last three years, I've been engaged in the Living Standards and Material Culture in English Rural Households 1300 to 1600 project which draws upon archaeological and historical data sets to understand the possessions of non-elite households in the medieval period. Analysis of the data set has stimulated me to think about confrontation in the household, and one object, ground stones, wet stones, or home stones used for sharpening metal blades, have proved particularly valuable in this process. Home stones have been imported in small quantities from Scandinavia through the early medieval period, but from around 1200, Norwegian schist home stones started to be imported to England in greater quantity, being relatively common finds on medieval sites, particularly in the east of the country. At Lid Quarry, a geographically marginal rural settlement on reclaimed marshland on the south coast of England, imported Norwegian home stones were one component of a home stone assemblage, which also included rectangular pieces of local stone, larger sandstone blocks and beach pebbles. These stones are identified by archaeologists as a single group of artefacts, united by their basic material, stone, and their function. Certainly, these factors do unite these artefacts, but in other ways, they're quite different. Simply categorising these objects as home stones neutralises the potential lines of flight or routes to deterritorialization and forms of becoming that interactions with these objects stimulated. Things, Levi Bryant proposes, are not defined by their essential matter, but by their effect, that is the outcome of relations. Some of these relations are persistent, the chemical bonds constituting the stone, others more fleeting, the glint as the light catches a particularly shiny mineral. Grouping artefacts necessarily relies on these persistent qualities, which might be interpreted as essential to these objects being. But what if we change tack and see these stones as ongoing processes of becoming, as progressing through a matrix of time and space, 
transformed into homestones as they enrolled into <coughs> processes of procurement, shaping, commerce and use, and extending beyond themselves as they're implicated in the emergent assemblage of mercantile capitalism. <coughs> this is not to deny the materiality of these stones. It's their persistent qualities of hardness and texture which are vital to their becoming. But these are only activated as the stones are drawn into relations of practice. The stones become homes through relations. Effect emerges from this dance between persistence and spontaneity. It's multi-temporal, contingent on past and enduring relations, but emergent in the present with its own temporality, maybe fleeting, maybe enduring through the relations that it stimulates. The pebbles and local sandstones found at Lid can be understood as scavenged materials. Lumps of stone and pebbles could be picked up through other activities, sometimes used and discarded on the spot, at other times brought to the house. These unshaped stones become something else as they find utility as sharpening stones. They might equally shed that fleeting association only for archaeologists to reactivate these relations through the creation of new ones with microscopes and reference collections. These foraged objects tell a story, one of self-sufficiency, one which jars with the narrative of capitalism's onward march. These objects bring to mind James Dietz's evocation of small things forgotten, but these objects also reveal small experiences forgotten. Much has been written about the role of rural households in economic progress, in intensifying farming practices, in engaging in wage labour and specialising in crafts. Certain foraging activities are in our consciousness, often through legal concerns, the clay pits which damage the public highway or the poaching of game reserved for the Lord's table. But the foraging of stone, whilst people may have noted the taking of stone from walls or the removal of boundary markers, the scavenging of natural pebbles or chunks of rock was of little consequence. It escaped notice. It was literally unremarkable. It has remained so because our concern has been with understanding progress. And as Anna Singh reminds us, scavenging and foraging aren't a part of progress. It was their enrolment in communities of practice which transformed these stones, practices of farming, fishing or domestic life, which demanded objects to sharpen blades, which entrapped people into relations of dependence, not only with tools, but with stone to secure their livelihood. The co-occurrence of Norwegian schist with foraged pebbles highlights the house as a site of confrontation between emergent mercantile capitalism and pre-capitalist forms of subsistence. Capitalism did not emerge fully formed. The co-occurrence of locally foraged and sourced stones and imported commodities perhaps provides evidence of the confrontation between liberated flows of materials and coded actions of labour and resource procurement, which is captured in Deleuze and Guattari's concept of capitalism as overcoding pre-capitalist ways of being. Unlike the pebbles and local stones, Norwegian schist's homes were commodities, alienated from their landscape of procurement, enrolled into a system of monetary valuation. They did not replace the local stones that did, but through their territorialisation into the household, they pulled domestic relations out of the local and into international commodity flows. Even if these particular commodities appear low value and innocuous, they played a role in prizing apart persistent relations. A number of quarries have been identified in Norway, and I'm fully aware there's people in the room who probably know far more about them than me, um, from which stone was extracted for the manufacture of millstones and homestones. It was millstones which were the primary uh, product, although these did not find their way to England. Already alienated from its landscape, stone had been translated into commodity. Stone had commodity potential for sure. But was there really an insatiable desire for exotic sharpening stones when many other stones would clearly do? No. Stone only afforded this potential through its entanglement with other substances, firstly grain and its demand for millstones, and secondly, fish. Stockfish accounted for over 80% of Norway's export trade. These diagrams on this slide show that the intensification of the import of Norwegian schist hones around 1200, this is evidence from Winchester, corresponds with an acceleration in the importation of stockfish from the Baltic and Arctic Norway, demonstrated by recent zooarchaeological and isotopic research. Stone entered the commodity chain as the product of what Anna Singh terms the salvage economy. Uh, the enrolment of natural resources, fish, stone and land, into confederations of exploitation and disturbance. Fishing on a comparatively massive scale <coughs> changed the landscape through extractive quarrying and the formation of new ecosystems through intensive agriculture. I've made the case elsewhere that the emerging global economy of the Middle Ages can be fruitfully understood as an assemblage of relations, a fluid and effective bundle of interactions. Our study of the past territorialises relations as a thing, 
the medieval economy. But in fact, what we're observing is a patchwork of flows and entanglements, the enrolment of stone and fish into household assemblages, the commodification of these items through enrolment in long-distance trading networks, the activation of the commodity potential of the stuff of pre-capitalist ways of being. The realisation of commodity potential was disruptive. It generated wealth out of nothing, and with it power over the resources which were needed to fuel urban expansion and sustain rapidly growing populations. A global capitalist economy was not an end, but an effect. These small-scale disruptive engagements with the material, what Jane Bennett calls a quivering proto-blob of Elan, an interstitial field of non-personal ahuman forces, flows, tendencies, and trajectories, what Deleuze and Guattari term desire, the energy which drives relations and which lead to unpredictable, unconscionable, and promiscuous confederations <coughs> of things emerging. The formalization of trade through regulation and the development of protectionist organizations such as the Hanseatic League coded these flows of commodities, constrained the actualization of desire intensifying their flow and creating the potential for their unfolding into household assemblages, in turn deterritorializing households, making them something else. As they were caught up in this web, they entered into new relationships of credit and were confronted by the commodity potential of what they'd once understood as common property. Our homestones are almost incidental to this story. They came along for the ride, but became entangled in this sticky spider's web of relations. Stone was affected by this translation and became effective in the emergence of new forms of economic relationship. These imported homestones were enrolled in other processes too. Their disrupt distribution is strongly biased towards towns, where they're often the only type of homestones present, as illustrated by the four pie charts at the top of this slide. In the countryside, the lower set of pie charts, they form one component of a suite of stones, perhaps each suited to particular tools. Indeed, the material properties of these stones must have played a role in persuading rural households to part with hard-earned cash to acquire them. In the town, we might perceive of stones as linked to the delicate tools of urban craftsmen and as personal possessions linked to that most ubiquitous of tools, the knife. Townspeople <laughs> did not have such ready access to pebbles or stones. Urban living demanded the importation and perhaps inevitably the commoditization of stone. Just as in the countryside, household economy trapped households into relations with stone, so too did urban life, but urban living could not meet this demand. In towns, homes were one of a suite of commodified forms of stone available, not in its raw form, but transformed into functional tools, homes, mortars, blocks. Urbanisation and commercialisation are, of course, intimately linked processes. But what flows of home stones into the countryside reveal is that these intimate personal relationships which were part of performing a distinctive mode of urban living, overflowed into the countryside, shifting the ways in which people engage with stone, creating confrontation between modes of existence. It was not only stone which transformed through these encounters, but households themselves. The distribution of these stones shows that they were not uniformly acquired by rural households. <coughs> this map shows the distribution of different types of whetstone recorded from archaeological context by the Living Standards Project. Their rural distribution is focused on eastern England. We're looking at the blue and red dots here. Um, and they do not occur at every site or in association with every household. They reveal that households engage differently with the market, that their confrontations with the commodity potential of stone were varied. Capitalism did not transform the household as a single historical moment, but as an effect of deterritorialization of domestic performance mediated by the things themselves. My point then is this, identifying homes geologically is a means of purifying them, making them a single type of thing which can be recognised, mapped and quantified. Using them as evidence of a master theory of commercial growth provides a context for their occurrence, but focusing on relations complicates matters. It causes us to consider three connected issues, the ways in which stone became a commodity, the implications of this transformation, particularly through the contrast which emerges between commodified and forage stone and the role of these things in drawing households into commercial networks. Exploring homes as singularities reveals the different ways in which capitalist relations did or did not surface, and provides a means of thinking through the medieval economy, not as a single system, but as a patchwork um, of encounters and happenings in which things gathered meaning and might change trajectory, becoming different things entirely. By focusing on effective relations rather than seeking the causal agency for capitalism in time or space, we can better equipped to write deeper histories which deconstruct the rigid territorialization of periods and spaces which entrap us into the development of evolutionary teleological narratives in which the only corrective is to push the birth of a phenomenon earlier in time. 
Both Geraldine Hang and Visa Immanen have critiqued the simplistic dichotomy between modernity and pre-modernity, um, which such an evolutionary narrative inevitably promotes. Heng, in particular, argues that the understanding of the development of development as a driving towards the 19th century industrial revolution is Eurocentric, ignoring the industrial revolutions of, for example, Song China. She argues that a consideration of time across the globe imparts a recognition that modernity itself is a repeating trans-historical phenomenon with a footprint in different vectors of the world moving at different rates. Immanen draws on Karen Barad's agential realism to consider the implications of the medieval as defined in opposition to modernity and calls for considerations of the implications of periodization in preventing the development of diffractive, or perhaps what Bridotti would term nomadic, methodologies, which call, up, uh, call for us to understand how these states emerge relationally. The scope of this paper doesn't take us beyond England, but the points that I wish to take from these considerations of temporality are as follows. Focusing on a single trajectory, a development from medieval to modern conceals from view articulations of modernity in the past. Time is not always linear. Rhythms of household life and life courses of objects, for example, may be cyclical or appear to recede and repeat. And time is not a measure of economic development, but is formed through it, as daily rhythms and cycles are disrupted. As Luce Irigray and Michael Marder argue, today, to the extent that it is seen as a triumph of modernity to overcome the limits of naturally derived temporal cycles, for example, of organic growth through intensive agriculture. Attending to effect and the ways in which it emerges from relations which unfold scales and temporalities can therefore prove stimulating in shifting our focus from understanding when and why capitalism happened to developing thicker and deeper narratives of how it happened and, more importantly, of what it did. Thank you.